Hey everybody, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough. Before I go too far into this video, can everyone let me know if they can hear and see me okay? Because um, YouTube is being real weird about live streams tonight. <coughs> I was actually set to go about half an hour ago and then like right before I went to go live, it was like, YouTube's not receiving enough information. You have to shut all these things down. So it's being real weird. Anyway, so I'll wait for your response, but in the meantime, hello, welcome to uh, Two Plus Tomes uh, Book Club. If you are curious as to, um, video's a little grainy. Interesting. Okay, very odd. Um, well, hopefully it doesn't have too much trouble. There's not much to look at anyway, this stream, but streams all over. Uh, very weird. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. But one thing uh, we're doing today is reviewing the book Dominion by Darius Hinks. Um, this is the the sort of um, the main book, I guess, for for the uh, the current edition that we're in as we're entering the story of Dominion. I'm half looking at the chat. I am pretty much just gonna pop it out and put it where I can see it. I'm trying to make sure everything's working. It's being real weird tonight. I apologize, everybody. Not how I wanted to start. But, <clears throat> uh, essentially what uh, we're gonna be doing here today is we're gonna start off with a non-spoiler review of the book and then go into full spoiler, spoiler territory, assuming you have read it. Um, and then we're going to just discuss some of the character development, some of the major plot points, things that we like, that kind of stuff. So, uh, tomorrow or no, tomorrow's Sunday, it'll likely be on Monday or Tuesday. I'll have a video out announcing what the next book is. And at the same time, the live stream will go up about when that's going to be. So you can read the book in the meantime and then catch up and we can have the same hangout and chat later on. So hopefully that works for everybody. Uh, as I said, today we're doing Dominion by Darius Hinks. So giving my um, non-spoiler review, what I would say about the book is it's a very interesting, I would say, um, book that came out with a core starter. Most of the time when, when Games Workshop puts these kinds of books out, they're really meant to push the models in the core set. So you see the book titled Dominion and we know that there was the Dominion set. Uh, that was absolutely stuffed to the gills with awesome models for the Cruel Boys and the Stormcast. <clears throat> and it does that a little, except there are some minor things where it just seems like... Um, it it seems like the book was written independent of knowing anything about the, the models of the box set, which is very likely, given the way that they have to work ahead of each other, <clears throat> the author and the people who make the models and stuff. Um, I liked it quite a bit. If you're looking for, uh, I think, a, a fairly fun adventure in, in the realm of Gur to try and understand what it's about, I liked it quite a bit. So I would say go ahead and check it out. Certainly it's worth, you know, if you have an audible credit or something like that, grab it anyway. It's a good thing. Um, and if I think, if I could put it in a strange way, I think it's more about setting the mood for the next chapter rather than like the other uh, box set books are designed to sell, right? Like they're designed to sell the models inside the core set. I feel like this one was much more of a, a sense for what the story is like. So if you're curious about that, go check it out. Um, let's see. David says this was a good mortals story. Yes, and the reason I brought up how peculiar the book is is because the focus is actually not on <clears throat> Stormcast, even though <laughs> Stormcast are cruel boys, even though that's what makes up the entire cover. Um, this is actually a story about two humans, a brother and sister. And so they interact with all these factions, but, uh, yeah, that guy, you know, I had this expectation, uh, going into the book that it'd be more about the Amberstone watch. I agree. That's what I thought too. That's the, um, the mini narrative campaign thing that comes in Dominion is called the Amberstone watch. Really like the slice of life that it offered. Grr, Excelsis was awesome. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to pretty much leave it there right now for spoiler free territory um beyond that i would just say it's a good book i think i i saw it on kindle for like 16 or 17 bucks or something like that 
just grab it up, snatch it, read it, enjoy it. You'll have a great time. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to move into spoiler territory. Okay. Battle Barn's gotten ahead of us here uh, talking about the events of the book. But we're going to go ahead and move into there. From here on out, this is your warning. I don't really have like a, I don't know, a way of denoting that. I'll go and just do it afterwards in the comments. Let's see, looks like my feed is sputtering for no reason. Okay. Interesting. Richard Reed does a fantastic job in the auto. Audio, okay. So are we into spoilers? Yes. Okay. So spoiler time for those of us who uh, read the book. First of all, hi, welcome. Um, Spoiler, the river of bugs was an amazing idea. Yes. So there was a lot of scenes that I want to talk about. Um, I want to start with the beginning of the book before I, I get ahead of myself, because there's one scene in specific that I thought was the single coolest thing that Black Library has created. So um, starting off in the city, I really... Okay, it says that I am back with an excellent connection. Can someone confirm before I go any further? <laughs> First of all, I love the chat that we're having in the group here as far as... Uh, I love this. Let's record, record it. Oh, I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, we see you again. And we are back. Sweet. Okay. I'm not going to touch a thing. If anything goes wrong, it's all YouTube's fault. How about that? So the thing that I was saying, I'm not going to waste a second. I appreciate the banter, but yeah. So um, what I was going to say is I felt like the intro that started off in the city was very overwhelming. And by that, I mean that, um, that the amount of information they threw at us in terms of learning who the main characters are, Nick's are, and... Um, I don't know why I can't think of her name. I, I don't want to touch anything. Anyway, his sister, the Dawn, I just kept calling her the Dawnbringer in my head. <clears throat> but, um, you know, kind of understanding their dynamic. And I, I liked the premise of him kind of being more of a, a lovable scoundrel, right? And her being someone who kind of went the higher road, you know? I mean, but she was just a guard captain. She wasn't like, you know, it, it wasn't quite as like, they took both. They took different paths that both of them I felt like could have been on. And I like that quite a bit. Zagora. Thank you, David. <laughs> I was thinking Magora and I was like, no, that's Magora's fiends from Underworlds. Um, so I felt like that was a lot. The one character that I did not like. I didn't like her in chapter one and I didn't like her in like the last chapter. She wasn't technically in it, but was the... The girl lady like Ocella or Ocella because I, I guess I feel like it was a lot to take in that he was working for her they have some kind of weird protector defender and defendee relationship that was never really explored they never kind of led anything where with that like they don't respect each other more at the end he doesn't think less of her um or think more of her I should say yeah uh, you know, so I just, between like that and like the chaos guy, I don't know. It, it felt, yeah, it felt like a lot. Okay. Now I'm going to pop my chat out. Uh, of course, the moment I touched my computer, it was like, things are happening too fast. Okay. Uh, they didn't do a lot with that character. She was just kind of there. Agreed, and I didn't. Um, I didn't really appreciate like she. She seemed like a. Um, I feel like the character could have been like someone who was really into like beast magic. What else would they look like? They would look like a crazy animal person, and she like has a snake in her robe and that kind of stuff. All those kinds of stuff that I thought would be really compelling if they had fleshed the character out more. But because she only showed up from the shadows to be like, here, have this MacGuffin. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just like, ah. 
uh, it was too much. Um, but the the visual aspect of her being kind of mangy, you know, having to be a wizard who kind of keeps things on the DL because of obvious persecution in the city. I liked it. Um, I didn't like her in the beginning, but now she ended up being my favorite. I don't dislike her as a character. I actually think she was set up to have a fantastic arc of like, we can't trust her because she's a crazy primal magic wizard lady who apparently was doing deals with chaos folks. Like we know the guy at the pier was a chaos follower, but beyond that, we don't have a lot of information. So like, who knows? Um, no, I do not know what the idea was. So like, I, I like where that started. And then if we could see like, no, 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 people aren't just black and white, good or chaos. There are shades and Gur is going to show us those shades. She is a primal bestial presence. Like, I think that's awesome. Um, I think that would have been a really cool arc. They just, I don't know if it was cut for the sake of brevity or what, but yeah. Um, so I, I really would have liked her. I did like when she showed up and, um, explain to everybody, like, you have to, like, let the stampede through when the cruel boys launched all the, uh, animals at them. I thought that was terrific. Um, but that was it for Osella. That was the only, only part that I was like, yeah, <laughs> she's awesome. Um, I wish there was more to that story. But anyway, um, we're going to start talking about some parts that you guys like, because you guys shot straight to the end and, like, all over the place with the cool like boat ride and everything like that. I started at the beginning uh, with the city. Uh, let's let's kind of skip through that. So we were introduced to some characters there. I'll be honest, um, I, I, most of the side characters I didn't really pay attention to. Like when they were talking about the the soldiers that they knew heaped in piles of dead bodies. I was like, I don't really remember that scene. I mean, I remember the scene with the guy, but I don't remember it mattering. So I was like, <laughs> um, let's see. So David says, I think Gur being a character of its own to get people that don't belong there was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, one of the things I said, you know, I said it earlier, like for, for the non-spoiler, I do believe that this next chapter we're going into as far as like the meta narrative is about the realms having their own identity. And I, I think maybe that ties into why like, we're focusing on Gur because it, ju it just oozes personality. Um, I, I think anyway, I like it. <laughs> but uh, I think it was, it was really quite amazing. Uh, wasn't the book like 500 pages? Yeah, it wasn't even that. It, it was not large at all. So I don't know why they would have cut anything if that was the reason I don't know, obviously. Um, the area felt dangerous. It felt like it was full of predators and prey. Uh, you talk about the squids and I, I did like, I did like the squigs quite a bit. I was like, I, I liked not, uh, being equally as incredulous as the characters in the book where they're like, what, <laughs> what the hell do you mean? It was just a bunch of squigs just laying in the middle of the damn road. So I felt like that was super fun. Um, to be a part of like, they're also being confused. I would say one of the most compelling scenes, uh, was when they get to the water and actually Biofoot mentioned this already where, you know, there's no, there's very little water and they basically ride down a river of serpents and stuff. And it wasn't so much the scene of, that the mental image of, um, actually riding on a bunch of snakes and junk. It was actually, as they described the boats going down the waterway or whatever, that other wildlife was poking its head out because they heard noise and was immediately being attacked by whatever hunts them. So the reason I like Gur so much is because I've often described it as uh, a realm-sized food chain. And it just showed that like everybody is being hunted and everybody's hunting something else. All those animals that popped their heads up were looking for their next meal and became somebody else's. And so I felt like in terms of having a scene that conveyed a feeling of the place, few scenes I think did it better than that. And and the squid one was a great example for that reason as well. I mean, just the idea of like, there are titans just 
randomly everywhere. <laughs> um, blood sucking squids, krakens, gargants. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Smog Town. Oh, hey, buddy. Got you into animosity. Nice. That's awesome. Um, I didn't read it, but I want to hear what y'all say. That's fair. I mean, that's fair. I mean, yeah. Uh, let's see. I took a ton of notes from the book uh, for my Forest Mega Dungeon D&D campaign. That is fantastic. Yes. Because everything did feel dangerous. That is a great way to uh, to nail it. That guy, you know, I saw your comment earlier. So I feel like that in terms of was probably one of the absolute best moments of the book because it conveyed a feeling more than anything else. The ups nature of writing ether boats down a river of serpents, which is just like a sentence that I never thought I'd say when I was growing up. But then also juxtaposed with like nature happening, but like at a crazy level, right? Where one is just ridiculous. And, and oddly enough, that's the ether boat thing, not <laughs> the colossal titans of the earth eating each other from the ground. So I thought that was quite funny. Um, let's see. Let's talk about some other characters. That guy, you know, said you love the Cogsmith, Colgrim. Yes. So uh, because I know we have a few people that were not interested in reading the book, that's totally fine. I'll, I'll have a lore video out for you. Colgrim was a very interesting character. He was a famous Dwarden engineer and designed on to go on the crusade i felt like there was going to be more to his story as well um they set him up to be like ch faced with these lofty goals of trying to exceed his competitors or i guess uh contemporaries and prove himself to be the best build something that lasts and uh i loved the element of there's like a transmuting rock or something, claw, inside the actual story, where uh, he's allowed to make more stone for the walls at an accelerated rate. So, like, there's, like, hope, right? That's that's one of the Acela McGuffins that she hands him. Um, I liked the idea that it corrupts people in a subtle way. Like, it's not necessarily an evil thing, but it, it, it got him, like, fixed on what he was doing. So he started to build too much. And so when they realized there was a problem... He just became a failure at that point. And, um, and then at the end, they were just like, and do it again. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> oh, uh, the Grizzly. Thank you so much, buddy, for throwing something in the tip jar. I love the way they showed off the Morkier cruel boys and how cunning and devious, a totally different side of orcs and orcs. Yep, yeah, that were just wonderful. Absolutely. And um, one of the things I enjoyed about the book, kind of going more to a back, a high level, instead of focusing on a specific character, was um, the way that they introduced the Cruel Boys. Because like I said, you can look at this cover and be like, oh yeah, it's Orcs and Stormcast, but it's not. I felt like uh, after the Kraken scene, which I don't really remember how far into the book that was. It couldn't have been terribly far. Um... Yeah, I mean, it, it was done before chapter 10. That's what I just flipped to by accident. So once they got past that, then I felt like everything from that point on was introducing us to this new enemy, that they were always being hunted, um, that the Stormcast arrived at the other city. If you don't know, the Stormcast broke away from the main crusade uh, at one point to go hey, where's our replacements? Where's all the defenses that we were expecting to meet up with? Um, so they went over to like the next uh, stronghold, the next settlement that's being planted over, and everyone was just uh, gone, okay? So that was the cruel boys doing that. Um, and there's just that creepiness of how we were introduced to them as a new enemy, the way that they fight, I have to say, in terms of greeting a new kind of enemy... Uh, I think it was probably one of the best introductions ever. So, Darius, if you're watching, that's a good job, man. Um, I'm going to give you guys time to respond here, but I want to talk about my favorite scene in the book. So, on the point that the Grizzly made about as far as, you know, showing off the different sides of the Cruel Boys, 
Uh, my favorite scene in the book by far was when they Stormcast go to that secondary city. Everyone's missing. They're checking all the different homes, everything. And it's just like everyone just walked away. And then they go inside uh, a tower and they look up and they see what is essentially like um, they took all the cattle and put it in a net and lifted it up. And they're like, are they trying to bait some huge creature? What in the heck is that? And so Oralos, the the leader of the Stormcasts within our story, starts walking up the tower to be like, what is going on with this? And as he gets higher, he realizes that it's not cattle and stuff. It's not just a gore bag. It's actually full of the still living inhabitants of the town. The cruel boys had come in, grabbed them all or tricked them or poisoned them, you know, like or, or messed with their minds and corralled them all into a giant net and hoisted them up way up into this this tallest point of this tower. So that's why the city was empty. All its residents were up there. Whereas Oralos is walking up to go save them, they also strung up a trap wire so that when he hit it, this body of an entire city's worth of humans just goes and hits the ground like with a nasty thud. It's disgusting. And so at this point, we have a, a weird juxtaposition with the Stormcast. Um, Orlos had been criticized earlier in the story for allowing a free guild unit to die in order to save more crusaders. And so people were like, well, why couldn't you just go help them too? Like you could have saved a few of them. That matters. And basically his response was the sort of, um, you know, I see the bigger picture. We needed to go. We need to keep going. Like, just forget about everybody. We have to leave some behind to make sure that the rest of us can make it. Very survival-esque, and I like that. And so someone who was criticized for being kind of heartless and cold, then we see him engage with an emotional side of, like, he fell for the trick and he killed an entire village worth of people on, on a stupid whim, right? Like, because he thought he was going to go up nilly. And so... That was a super harsh moment. Um, I felt like I felt like that was probably one of the better story arcs. Like I feel like um, Nixar and Aralos both definitely had arcs, right? And that's a great thing because a lot of these Black Library novels, the only change between stories is whether or not you have a bullet in your head. But um, for this one, I felt like, you know, having those two scenes not terribly far from one another was, was very impactful uh, because you're looking at the limits of what it means to be a Stormcast. You just lose humanity, right? And then what do you do when you kill the very people you're trying to protect and, like, that weighs on him? I, I loved that. That was actually a really – it was an intense, like, uh, eerie moment when, they, when he realizes it's people – and then uh, when it hits the ground, there is one woman who survives a little bit. I mean, it, it was one of the kind of falls that no one should survive. But uh, she survived for a little bit to kind of warn about Kragnos. So, I don't know. Um, and, and that was like, again, that introduced us to the Cruel Boys. But we didn't see a single one of them in that scene. It wasn't until after that, um, as they're kind of like, all the Stormcasts are just kind of staring at this mass of dead bodies. After that did the laughter start, and that's when the Stormcast started chasing them. And so that's the kind of thing that you, I don't know. It's just, it was super grim. Yeah. <laughs> um, in my head, she survived because she, uh, cause of their bodies. Very likely, yes. Um, exactly. Nearly every crusade failed. If anything, it is more interesting because people actually care when things go too far. Yeah, absolutely. Got disappointed every time they went back to Nixcar after that point. Just wanted them to go back to the Stormcast. I can see that. Um, I really do. I, okay, so actually let's do that. Let's take a pause there with the Stormcast story because that's, that's great. That's when they're first splitting off and starting to meet the, the cool boys Let's focus on uh, Nixar and, and Zagora. Um, give me one second. My YouTube is telling me my stream is perfect and is also receiving no data at the exact same time, which makes not a single bit of sense. Hmm. Okay. 
Okay. I'm going to press on because it doesn't seem like it's shutting down. Someone want to say something just so I know it's not over yet? Doesn't look like it's keep going. So something. There you go. Thanks, David. Um, so all in all, I thought uh, Nick Scar scenes were pretty interesting. One of the things I've always kind of wondered about Cities of Sigmar is because we, you know, we see that kind of traditional fantasy stuff um, as far as uh, hmm, I'm still seeing you. Weird. YouTube's being very bad tonight. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, hmm. What do I want to do? Still see in here. Not over. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to keep going. So, I felt like uh, Nixgar's scenes... We're, we're pretty we're pretty cool because they they picked on a part of cities of Sigmar culture that I always wondered which is like what is upward mobility look like um so on uh, on one hand you know like he doesn't want to be there obviously he kind of got not hoodwinked but weird circumstances put him in the crusade and then he is looking to you know raise his stature I loved the idea so when when I read the the lore about Don bringer crusades in the core book it made it seem very optimistic like people could just kind of go out there and earn a keep and establish a lineage and you know get it on the ground floor on the next city of sigmar like that's super cool when i uh read darius's take on that same concept i i feel like um it was much more realistic how about that in terms of we're watching nick be like i want to be somebody um, you know, I'm in the dirt right now. There's a bunch of nobles up the hill who are having a great time here. I want to be one of them, not one of here. It's the same old story. You know, I'm just going to be a dirt shoveler in this place just like I was before. So it was just kind of a strange, um, not strange, but it was a really nice kind of like addition to that story arc of like, you know, he wants to be somebody. What does it mean in Cities of Sigmar to leave the city? I feel like the same social hierarchy status stuff would kind of transfer over, and that's kind of what he was thinking too. So I thought that was wonderful. Uh, as far as the action that he was in, the dude should have been dead like eight times over. But, um, you know, plot armor is apparently thicker than Sigma, right? So, you know. <laughs> It is what it is. Um, I generally like his scenes. I kind of agree. I, with so many of these Black Library books, quite frankly, I'm thinking more about 40K books specifically. A lot of them are uh, what's called uh, bolter porn, which is just action scene after action scene, and that's all it is. Um, to that end, I did like the action scenes in this. I do wish there was a bit more of them. Like I almost wish that fight at the end was protracted a little bit longer. And so I just wanted to see more Stormcast fighting and doing stuff. You know, I feel like this was a fantastic book for giving us a sense of GUR. Not so much for actual, like, Dominion, meaning the set of models. I, the fact that Indrasta wasn't actually in the book, I was just like, but, but she's the Angel of Sigmar or whatever. So... Armor at the tensile strength of plot forged by the great smith. The author said so. I love it. That's a fantastic one. I thought Nixgar was a good character, especially when he escaped the siege in the finale, but then realized he couldn't leave Zagora. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I would agree with that. That was a very interesting moment. Uh, certainly, certainly a powerful one, where it's just like, uh, at the end, he was about to banner. He had a choice to be his normal scoundrel self and then go back and help his sister. And he just was like, I can't. Because even if I survive, like, I'm never going to live with myself. So, which I thought was really cool. That being said, I also love the fact that he made that choice when his sister made the other. Like, her, his sister made the choice to detonate the thing with her in it. Like, she knew she was going to die. Um, 
And I, I love that those those are the same choices though, right? Like you do whatever it takes for the one you love, but they looked differently, but they still both had the end result of leaving the other alone, right? So whether it's um, Nick Scar running away or whether it's her detonating everything, like I just thought that was a really, I don't know. I felt like that was a powerful way to end it, especially because they had built her up with the priests and so much as being like, this holy figure well to know that we're in a setting where like even the whole nothing nothing can be so sacred as not to be used to its fullest extent right i don't know what did you guys think about that what did you think about the ending with uh if you don't know ardent keep was the is the city that they were trying to build and it ended up being built on sort of the wrong location and so basically the heroine of the story sent all the survivors to the correct location while she and one of the storm casts um detonated or nuked the old one with all the orcs in it so like they basically took out the arm the opposing army with them which was pretty cool so, uh i thought it was it was pretty great not to derail a talk about wholesome sibling relations. Um, yeah, I mean, they seemed, they seemed sweet on each other. I love the way that he just described, like, you know, either, like, knowing that face or I think they were, like, eating or something like that next to each other. And, like, they, and they just seemed familial. They just seemed very comfortable with one another, and I like that quite a bit. Um, that guy, you know, the torture and death of the scout was another grim scene. Did the cruel boys carve a grin on his face? I don't know, but that would only make it more awesome. So we don't know, but there was a um, a scene where, like, the captain of the guard is... I love the way that he was constantly described as sounding, like, dead inside when he was talking. He just sounds totally emotionless. He's like, they're taunting us. They're trying to break our spirit. And all the priests are like, what are they doing? Go out there and get them. And he looks outside, and they basically... Uh, not truly in the sense, but they sort of like strung up or, cru I mean, in a kind of in a sense crucified, but not the same pose kind of thing. But they strung up one of the scouts that the free guild leader was sending out. And so um, every time that they would try to go and take the man down, he, what was it? He would be like eaten. Someone correct me. I don't remember how he died on that thing. Um... But yeah, so animals would you would either have to sit there and watch your your buddy starve or get eaten by wildlife as he's kind of stuck to a tree, or if you walked out there, they would be like killed instantly. Um, I'm waiting to see. I can't remember how they died. Can someone tell me? That guy, you know, I know that you would probably know. Uh, let's see. But anyway, yeah, so the way that it was set up, I'm just going to go ahead. But the way it was set up that the scouts would be there dying slowly and terribly. But if you went out to go try and get them, they would have a worse fate. And so the idea is just like spear traps. Okay. Yeah. So you couldn't try to rescue them without inadvertently inadvertently killing them so that was super rad um i'm gonna go back here talk about the ending uh let's see on the ending it felt very pragmatic and honestly a little gurish the land spawned a new enemy we didn't know how to deal with that's true the issue with true colonies it's often very very hard on the initial attempts uh, and if it's colonialism, then locals are hostile and become nearly impossible. Yeah, I, that was one thing. I guess. Oh, I'll word this. I felt like it was a very intense ending, and it ended so abruptly. And I was just like, oh, snap. The end of the story, the happy ending is that, like, hey. Not everybody's dead, <laughs> which is just like shrug. I was like, this is the kind of book I'm he I'm here for. Um, 
Nathaniel, I guess what I liked about Osella is the way she was the catalyst for Nixar's change. I don't know if Nixar would have gone back to his sister without the mini... Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, maybe... I don't know, because I don't remember her trying to, like, stop him. I, I feel like... Yeah, I, I feel like she was a cool character, and I definitely... If they ever made a side story... Um, Darius. So, if they ever do a side story that's about her, I think that there is an immense amount of potential in that character. Having uh, a, a Wizard of the Wilds, you know, and, like, that kind of stuff. I don't know. I just felt like it was so cool. I'm here for it. Just what she did in this specific book, I was kind of like, eh, eh. So, yeah. Um, that guy you know, Zagora turning into a Stormcast was awesome. Yes. So if you don't know, uh, the main heroine is human. The entire story, she's basically a war priest uh, by any other name. And uh, she's like has white armor and a double-handed, uh, was it a double-handed war hammer or something like that? It's just ridiculous. I was like, this woman is awesome. And then at the end of the story, after she detonates uh, the entire place, uh, she shows up just as a moment, saves two kids, and they ask her her name, and she's like, my name's Agora. They call me the Dawnbringer, because she was the Dawnbringer here. It's like, I love it. Um, so, I mean, honestly, that's kind of like the perfect fodder for like a um, event-exclusive model or something. Like, if, if like, going to... Or an story anniversary model, something like that. Or it's like Zagora, the Dawnbringer, and she has some cool element of the story on her. That'd be rad. Give me one second. <coughs> Excuse me. So sorry. Um, was fitting for showing how Sigmar picks people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Will these characters appear in future books? Uh, well, I don't know. Because... The more we go, that's a really great question, by the way. Um, the more we go on into Age of Sigmar lore, like over the years, they kind of just lurch forward like decades, if not centuries. And so it's so hard to to know what they're kind of thinking character wise. I mean, you know, they don't even talk about the initial Bandis or like Corgus Cole. Like those guys don't even exist anymore. I mean, they do. I'm not saying they don't, but I'm just saying like they don't reference them very much anymore. So I don't know. Um, I'd love for them to at least follow Zagora. I mean, she's a stormcast, so uh, you know because of her immortality, she can work through different story arcs and time periods. Um, as far as the city, I would love to see the development, like because. You know, seeing how a city is essentially planted is great. I mean, that's what this story was about, right? They made it to the end. The last actual chapter before the epilogue was other Stormcast being like, huh, there's a city down there. I didn't think there was a city down there. And that, I don't know why it was a whole chapter, but whatever. Um, I, I liked seeing it. That was a really cool story of how harrowing it is. And you can see how many things would go wrong. I guess when I think about the book in terms of showing me how cities are created, my question is, is every single one of them led by a Dawnbringer like her? My assumption is she's special in some way, but they're all part religious crusade, part settlement building, so I don't know. Um, the church seemed very involved, right? The Sigmarite church. But then also, like, what is that next step, right? Um... What does a pioneer city look like as they're trying to, like, you know, establish themselves a little bit more? It would probably mean walls, but it would also mean a lot of different things in Gur specifically. You would have to build in ways like the animal stampedes and that kind of stuff. Um, if they established a city, then maybe these families could be the ones that established industries. Oh, like follow their lineage. That'd be kind of cool. Multi-generational story. Barrow. Do we know what storm host Zagora belongs to? I don't know. I, th I thought it was... What armor did they describe? Let's see. It was like right at the end. Um, 
trying to look to see what the armor type was. Clad in huge plates of metal armor. Raised a hammer from light, filling the gully with the... Uh, You know, I'm not seeing. Sparks flickered, the air shimmered. Nothing, so. I don't see anything that specifically mentions which storm host she's a part of. I'm, I'm reading it right now, sorry. Um, nothing describes the, the color of the armor. Uh, it just says it was clad in plates of metal armor. That's it. Um, I think they referenced golden armor. Oh yeah. Runes written in blue fire glimmered across its golden battle plate. That is true. That is a line that's there. So if it's golden... I mean, if it's golden, it could be, uh, it could still be a myriad of things because there are several golden storm host chambers. Um, obviously, Hammers of Sigmar, if they're going to make a special character sheet for her because they're all Hammers of Sigmar except for Gardas. I was honestly kind of hoping that they, uh, that he went a different direction and was like, boom, she's a hallowed knight because she died in absolute faithful servitude. She was like the church's little thing <laughs> um a puppet and also but like holy relic that was living amongst them so i would really like if that's what it was so i don't know if it was hammers of sigmar or so you know obviously it could be a myriad of sub chambers within there but it's what i got she's wielding the hammer so i can't i can't imagine she's a retributor that'd be not a retributor a uh, liberator I think they implied every crusade, or at least a lot, were led by someone called the Dawnbringer. Yeah, that's what I thought. So when I started the book, I remember reading that of, like, being astounded that there were so many crusades happening. I, I just love if each one of them was led by um, a religious figurehead. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Because not only am I interested, I mean, this is, this is good world building, right? Because it makes me interested to know more. I want to know everything about how the church, like, not examines, but I guess interrogates the people who see things in the auger stones. Be like, how do you know what you know? What does it mean to be the Dawnbringer? How do you test that, right? And so I just thought it was interesting. I think she's special, but Dawnbringer is a title. That could absolutely be. So, like, yeah, instead of... Like, there's always a religious figurehead called the Dawnbringer, but there was something different about Zagora, so that's why she had this whole entourage and bells and whistles and junk. Um, she seemed too hopeful to be a Knight's Excelsior. That was actually kind of my thought when I just didn't want her to be Knight's Excelsior because I was like, oh, but she was so sweet. I don't want her to be heartless and unforgiving like they are. Like, when I describe the Knight's Excelsior, like they're they're not nice <laughs> but she's cool um let's see really small part of it but i loved the prophet guild that was in excelsius the description of it and the function of the shop where they got a good look into the mind's eye yeah actually that's a good point let's talk about excelsius um those first chapters even though i criticize them for being like very rapid and throwing a lot of information at us uh, they give us a great look into what the city is like in terms of, one, sh people are shady as all get out. Like, there's still all kinds of back alley deals happening. Um, even though nothing came of the chaos cultist in the story, the fact that he was just there and, like, there's just dudes who have tattoos all over him with chaos symbols and that kind of stuff, like... You can never trust anybody. And that's really interesting. I thought that was a, a very cool throw-in. It set up uh, Ocella to be a great character because it gave her a lot of like, are you evil? Without actually having her do an evil thing. So I thought that was a... That's why, that's why I was excited for her as a character. Um, the rest of it, you know, I loved the feel of them moving through the city. You already mentioned the, the prophet or the prophecy guild or whatever it's called. Um, thought that was 
that was really smart. Because, yeah, they make their bread and butter on magical stone and junk. Um, I don't know. What else was there in the city specifically? I felt like that was cool. Oh, the general fear of the Knights Excelsior. You know, it's it's their home. It's Excelsius. Um, they should be celebrated heroes, but people are like, each one of them is like an inquisitor that is just, I'd rather kill you than ask a lot of questions. Uh, and that's, that's dark. <laughs> um, having your populace afraid of their protectors is an extremely... It's a dark idea, all right? And and then it's like, well, how come these chaos uprisings? It's like, well, maybe if you took your iron boot off everyone's head and just let people be chill. <laughs> what if we all just relaxed? <laughs> Things are getting a little intense around here. So that's the kind of stuff where I'm like, yeah, the Knights Excelsior, that, that city is controlled with an iron fist. So I thought that was really cool. Um... You heard it here first. Doug thinks fascism is cool. That's not what I'm saying. I meant in terms of giving us insight into the city. It was a cool way to, to build anxiety naturally in the setting of like, why is everyone so weird? Like all of these things happened because someone was friends with someone who was friends with someone who had a chaos tattoo on their chest. And you're just like, but the, the, the characters reacted to that so intensely that it spun off into this whole story. And so I was just like, I thought in terms of giving us insight into why people reacted so intensely, uh, I thought it did great. Uh, do all the humans come from Azir more or less? So there are survivors in, in all the realms that have either made it through because chaos hadn't reached there yet because it didn't fully envelop everything. But... Um, these, they're typically called, was it the Reclaimed, I think? But a large majority of the humans have some Azir ancestry. However, remember at the time of this book, Dominion, people have been living in the realms for possibly up to 200, 300 years. So, like, there are several generations of people going out there and expanding. So, like, you know, at what point, at what point do you, do you say, like, yeah, I'm from Azir, even though if like the last three generations of your family was in Gur. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, on that note, Nixar talking about the old gods got me interested. Yeah, I don't have a lot more on that because I, I don't really know much. But I um, thought that was a, an intriguing conversation. Uh, I also love taking something as amazing as foresight and using it for the mundane. Like forecasting the weather. <laughs> That would be amazing. Um, thought the use of prophecy as a theme was very well done. The arcs of Arlos and Zagora have them deal with trying to make their visions come true. Night of Zen, that is a very insightful point. Um, I, I, I have some notes here from my thoughts on the, on the book. And one of the things that I was... Um, so compelled by were like the reoccurring themes in the book. Like I think as an author, um, Hanks did a great job at like take, taking just a couple themes and then putting them in different contexts. So like the theme of sacrifice with Arlos not caring about sacrificing the free guild to being devastated when he like kills a whole village worth of people by accident um, to then, you know, basically making a heroic last stand trying to save anybody he can right like that's a great story development and it just reinforces the theme of sacrifice um i thought another great theme was the use of prophecy so because it's one of those things like if you have a character that knows the future it can take a lot of the wind out of the sails of the drama right because it's like well why don't they just know what the problem is and so um having the different kinds of foresight like there is the, the I'm going to say commercial grade foresight that the profit uh, market was, was allowing people to have. And then there was the Zagora level of prophecy, which was, I have these images that come to my mind. One was where they should make camp. Two was uh, the river, because she, she did confirm that she knew about the river of serpents and that Colgrim designed the ships for it. 
Uh, what else did she know about? She knew the area of where Arden Keep was supposed to be, but when it came to the specifics of all of those things, she was equally like, I don't know, which hill should we go on in this one valley? I don't know, let's go on that one. And she picked the wrong one. <laughs> um, but the idea of like, you know, introducing different levels of, of ability and like contextualization for these visions, I thought was a really strong move. The idea of Orlos's visions though, I never quite understood why he had this vision of working with Androsta specifically. It just seemed like, I couldn't tell if it was a literal vision, like it was a prophecy that he had, or if, I guess it was, I don't know. I'm not quite sure about that one. His his foresight seemed very different, where it's like he had this perfect image of what he wanted things to be, but how much of that is what he actually thought it was or what he wanted to see, right? Did he want to see his his dudes in, like, gleaming armor standing next to the Angel of Sigmar and all these things versus, like, that was just not a possibility. Um... Too buzzed up. It reminded me of the old saying that a man often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. <laughs> I like that. That's a good one. Um, question. I kind of like they couldn't find the city immediately. A uh, straight line on a map. Didn't they establish the cities or buildings in Gur was even harder because the land constantly moves. Uh, you mean when they're trying to find the abandoned city or the, the sacked city? Yes, although it's hard to tell exactly at what point the fog started directing their paths. Because they were walking in fog before they found the town. And then, you know, because then the buildings started to peek out of the fog and they figured out where they were. Um, but yes, I agree. I like that they... There's this idea... I don't know this. So the idea of the Excelsis Road is one that I, I, I knew about in the back of my head, but I, I don't feel like it was really explored before this, this idea of like a vital supply line to keep Gur going. And I know in this book, I, what chapter completely eludes me, but they mention the fact that it's now like broken up because the road itself is going in different directions. It's, it's a living thing. And if you're not constantly traveling it, the road pulls away. And so this is an example of that where it's like, Things, you know, the cities aren't being traded to. They're not being traveled to. Um, they just fall into obscurity and move away with the continent. And I was just like, oh, dang, that's super savage. Because, yeah, it's like, what good is a map? <laughs> Nothing. No, it's not good at anything. It's like a map in Chaman when there's, like, floating islands. It's like, where the heck is that going? Same concept. <laughs> um, let's see. So yes, but yeah, I would imagine the roads do move. Um, I mean, we know at least the Excelsis Road. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I feel like we touched on. This I had I mentioned my favorite scene with the people or Aralos's horror when he kills the whole city. Uh, as far as the actual like conflict with the cruel boys, you know, I I know for a fact. I know from Soul Wars when I was doing research into that before we did the book club for it that the Black Library authors basically start writing the book before they have all the details. So, and I think that's the reason why it's the Knight Arcanum that's the hero and not the Lord Imperitant. Um, even though the Knight Arcanum is just kind of like a dude <laughs> in, in, this, in the stat. He's just like, oh yeah, we need a wizard to teach us about magic in the starter set. Here you go. It's the Knight Arcanum. I had a touch of skipping. Yeah, I'm going to wrap it up here pretty soon, guys. I think the internet's just against me today, apparently. But, yeah, it's not the internet. It's YouTube, specifically. But, yeah, one of the things that I wanted to, to touch on was this idea of, like, I, I feel like this is a great book, like, standalone. Like, if, if there was never a Dominion box and this just came out, I would love this book. Um, because to me, it does a few things that I think Games Workshop needed to do. It, um, it's saving its good work for tomorrow. Oh my God, let's hope so. If that doesn't work, I'm going to be devastated. So I, I like that it's, first of all, human focused. 
right? That they're, they're mostly mortals and that there is a Stormcast contingent there and we get to see them have friction over the value of life and the nature of their mission and that kind of stuff. I thought it was wonderful. Uh, I like getting to see a city planted. Uh, we learned a little bit about the lore from like the Nexus Siphon and all the different statues that would block away ghosts. Um, and that was all really cool to see. I appreciated that. Just getting a chance to see it all. But yeah, it, it just seemed so odd um, to have a, a Dominion book, you know, the campaign, sorry, the book that matches the starter set and then be like, we're not going to talk about most of the Stormcast stuff. We're not, we're not really going to show the cruel boys. So I was very taken back by it, but I absolutely loved it. It, it posed the setting of Gur as just as much of a problem as the actual enemy, which was the cruel boys. Thought that was really brilliantly done. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, and honestly, uh, this is the kind of book where, you know, I don't know how much the author knows about what they're planning in the GW studio, but this is the kind of content that people who play Cities of Sigmar or used to play fantasy battles and loved Empire and like are trying to get into AOS lore, this is the kind of stuff that like we all drool over. Because it's just a very grounded setting. They're moving at a reasonable pace. You know, I mean, like, it's hard. Everyone's exhausted and half dead by the end if they're not fully dead. But it's it's like a human thing. It's a human story. And we understand. And we can have arguments with people who don't understand that. Um, so I, I just felt like, you know, this might be my new recommendation over City of Secrets. When it comes specifically to fantasy battles folks getting into aos i feel like this is a great one for teaching people not only a grounded story but also giving you a sense of the setting and i, I did feel like the setting was quite terrific because even the fantastic beasts it shows you you know like the mega gargant fighting the kraken it was an incredible scene of like god tier titans all punching each other in the face but at the same time it's like well we've seen the mega gargant model no one coming into this would be weirded out if they showed a model that they eat. He's literally called the Kraken Eater. He's, he's fist fighting a Kraken. I, I feel like well documented the status quo. So, you know, for the folks who really struggle with some of the more abstract, you know, kind of concepts of the higher fantasy of AOS compared to the Tolkien esque stuff, I feel like that's probably a win, right? I, if, if that's the craziest it gets, is a model we make. So, so that's on the, on the folks of. Um, who are fantasy battle players coming into it. But then, like me, I want to know what a city is like, right? Like, I want to know everything about um, the Azurite Church because they were major players in this, you know? I mean, if things went according to plan and everything was perfect, which it never was going to be, but you know what I mean? If things were great, the church in Zagora would have been uh, vitally important. They would have been like the head of the city, would have had wealth, power, that kind of stuff. So, like, the, the fact that the church is taking that role in planting cities actively, whether they fail or not, is very interesting to me. So you have stuff like um, the role of church and the nature of the church and state, because they're kind of linked. Um, the, how the realms react, because I imagine this story would have gone very differently in literally any other realm. I wish there was a story like this, quite frankly, in Shyish. Like, as much as I'm kind of done with Shyish after the whole malign portents and all that kind of stuff, I will be honest that, like, the kinds of naturally occurring dangers and stuff, it just sounds interesting. Any realm sounds interesting, to be honest. When you If you pitched this exact story and you just changed the Gur theme to the theme of any other realm, I would be so on board. <laughs> <laughs> like I love the girl one. I'm just saying it's it's the perfect story because it could happen anywhere and it's the great way to show us what these realms are like. So uh let's see. It's one of the better audiobooks they've done. I haven't listened to the audio. Um I really I wanted to support my local store, so I bought the hardback cover also because I wanted it on my shelf. And at some point I would love to get it signed um by the author. Cruel Boys in the Realm of Shadows seems like a perfect plan. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Imagine this same story and there's like living shadows snatching people in the night and some other weird stuff that I just 
made up. <laughs> but you know, it could be, I don't know, they instead of like a kraken attacking and kind of being sort of saved by a gargant fighting, it could be, uh, man, I don't know, like a shadow beast comes and starts raiding the camp and then the mothman flies down and snatches it up and you're like, what? <laughs> sulfuric swamps that's what oh yeah so um i'm gonna leave it open here i'm just any last thoughts uh we just had an hour just chatting about it um as far as you know kind of a rating i would give i i think it's a fantastic book i i almost kind of wish it wasn't tied to the dominion name or box art because i feel like it could have been its own thing um i will say it was a great way to introduce the cruel boys this slow building as we're learning with the stormcast that this is a new kind of enemy first of all but then specifically a new kind of orc was really cool we don't have full context yet on what to them kragnos and the end of empires is uh, i really did enjoy it the, the fight scenes were really cool when they had them i don't feel like there was too much i feel like the the camera focus so to speak perspective on the mortal elements I guess another way to word this is I felt like more of the book was about survival than it was about fighting bad guys, right? Survival in the sense that like the whole realm's against them. Everything around you is dangerous and harrowing. So I felt that like it just felt really cool. And yes, in the end, the cruel boys attacked, but it's like, my goodness, man, just literally making it out to this open field was the hardest thing ever and like 2,000 people died. <laughs> you know, I, and not to mention, like they haven't even done, it. so what, the whole trip probably took, I think it was five days because they marched for three to the point where the Krakens were. They marched for a half a day, reached the river, and then by the end of that day, they had reached Arden Keep. So it was a four-day travel. We'll say five, it can bleed into the... Um, like... It, it, I don't know, man. I made it past five days in uh, Oregon Trail. Like, everyone still died of dysentery, but I made it further than that. So the fact that, like, all these people are dying <laughs> in the first four freaking days was just nuts to me. Um, yeah, so I, I, I feel like it was a great book for making the environment seem real and active, as well as giving us, the readers, something to learn. One of the things that I, I worry about when I suggest certain books to uh, new people is the idea of like, well, how much do you have to already know? How much do you have to already know about Stormcast or Chaos or Archaeon or all their plans or whatever to really understand and grasp the book and then enjoy it? And this is one where because we are learning about the realm of beasts as people are engaging it and we're learning about the cruel boys as they are actively harassing the stormcast uh i thought it was fantastic because then new people can read that and they can learn at the same time so uh, i think that's very valuable um hear me out this cast of characters is recycled in future launch box tie-ins i'd be fine with that what do you future launch box tie-ins what would that be so would there be like um an ardent keep kit that would have them in it i'm curious because that's an interesting idea um question so you know we got hammer hall and other stories i would love if we got farming and other occupations and it's really almost a city founding guide almost textbook like that would be really cool honestly um i know at the back i did notice there was this. Uh, it says your next read, and it has Thunderstrike and other stories. Thunderstrike being the new kind of Stormcast armor. So, is that already out? I don't think so. Oh, I see. It's a little start here booklet, so maybe it's like a... No. It's a compendium of different stories. I don't quite know, but hopefully. I would absolutely love to, to read stories about a founding city, because... That's the thing. I don't want to always read about Cities of Sigmar when it's like, they came to the walls and sieged against them. It's like, and then you have random stories from like Malign Portents or Broken Realms of just like settlements that are out there in the in the wild. And you're like, well, how are those guys alive? Like, no, 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 no. Show me whole towns, all that stuff. Let's start 
repopulating the realms. So now that when we have campaign books that have chaos or destruction or death coming in, we have more space to have an ebb and flow. I like it. Uh, I love the book. Interestingly, I read it more. It read more like a 40k novel than AOS. This is unsurprising, given that Hanks is the preeminent author of Mephiston. I actually just learned that. I, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, and it's mainly just because I don't read any 40k books. But uh, yeah, I found him, and I was like, "Oh, is he a new guy to the the Black Library author stuff?" And then I saw his like incredible record of some of the best books ever in 40k, and I was like, "Oh." I've just been missing out. Darius Sinks is awesome. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think that's fantastic. One of the things we have in the core book is um, sort of like a, a small roadmap to what city building will be like. Because if you saw the core book or my video on um, the Dawnbringer Crusades, they did exactly what we saw. They plant the Nexus Siphon. They put their little grid up of stones to kind of make a, a perimeter to keep ghosts out but the core book went a little further into like and now they'll have a barracks and then they'll start building farms and it's like that's the kind of stuff that i'm curious about like what does that look like <laughs> you know i mean it's just so crazy what does it look like when a random orc wah when it's just like 30 to 40 boys because i mean that's the thing all not, not everything's a massive army so it's like, what does it look like when some of those things happen? Like, I want to see that, those kinds of stories or intrigue happening from within its walls and that kind of stuff. Sigmar's Batman changed my mind. Useless at snap choices. Uh, but given prep, he's super ready. <laughs> That's awesome. He doesn't have as cool of a belt, though. Like, no one ever praises Sigmar for his belt. More of a, oh, it is, 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 is the beard the belt of the face? He just keeps all his gadgets in his beard. I would respect that. Um, okay. Well, uh, I'll open it one last time. Does anybody have any last-minute thoughts or, or reviews? I'm going to go ahead and say I thought it was a great book. Uh, I'm going to throw a poll up for the patrons probably on Monday um, for the next book. And then at the same time, I will... Uh, figure out yeah what we need to read and that kind of stuff no nothing else really much more to say about it uh other than the only thing that i would say about this is i wish there was more <laughs> like i wish there was a uh, more chapters that made acela a cool character like a cooler character i would have loved to see her have an arc or a redemption story where we figure out like no She's not being held out at arm's length because she's a chaos worshiper. She's actually like showing us what Gur magic and being a, a wizard of the wild is like. Um, I think that would have been really cool. And uh, other characters, Haxor was just rad. Can we all agree? Like, best girlfriend ever, <laughs> I guess. I mean, she's like a boss. She just goes on and takes half everything. Half of all the fights are won by her. But anyway... Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and do a smaller review video with some of the, the things that y'all mentioned here in the chat. And then, of course, there will be a, a lore video uh, on Dominion, kind of summarizing it in a 15-minute like a thing like I normally do. So anyway, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and uh, chatting this fine evening. And I will talk to you all very, very soon, hopefully with less computer problems, in uh, my live stream tomorrow for a charity. So thank you. I'll see you all then.